Welcome to Share, a podcast production of Amethyst Recovery Centers. I'm your host, Kabir Singh. At the top of each episode, we'd like to remind our listeners that addiction is treatable and recovery is possible. If you worry a loved one needs help with addiction, call Amethyst today at 855-80-SOBER or visit us online at amethystrecoverycenters.com. Today on Share, we have a very special guest, Amethyst Health and Amethyst Recovery Center's very own co-founder and Chief Operating Officer, Michael Silberman. Anyone who knows Michael today knows that he is a consummate professional, a passionate and generous businessman and entrepreneur. However, like many of us in recovery, that was not always the case. For years, Michael struggled with substance abuse disorder, namely a heroin addiction, and sought treatment many times before finally reaching his sobriety date in July 2005. Today, we're going to discuss a bit about Michael's story and get some insight into the world of substance use treatment. Michael, welcome to Share. Thank you. Thank you for having me. <laughs> it's so funny here because, you know, I, I, I often call you Michael. So it's like I'm some sort of... I feel like I'm getting yelled at by yeah. my mother. <laughs> and if, so everyone, you know, either it generally calls you Mike and, and there's often a lot of people that call you Mikey. So, so welcome. Um, I, I like I like calling you by your full name. I understand, oh, Michael. <laughs> I don't remember your middle name, or I would say it right now, which would be great. You don't remember the joke, right? A, oh, you don't have a middle yeah, name. Yeah, that's a, right. I have that's no right. middle name. We could not afford one when I was born, so <laughs> that, that's the joke. Um, you know, you I, I do know enough about you, and there's there's language in recovery that we use. Um, of course, you know, on these podcasts, we the, the um, socially known word for it is sober you know i think i think the language that you and i use, like to use is clean and, and you know you've been clean for almost 16 years now we don't we, while we don't like to get ahead of ourselves sure those in recovery we identify with the actual time it is today so you know 15 years and and change, and change. On, on your way to 16 15 years and a wake up and a wake up yep, yep. <laughs> <laughs> um let, let's start at the beginning you you have a very interesting, you know, before we, for the listeners, before we start this, this podcast, I go over a bunch of things and, and, um, because a lot of times people have not sat behind a microphone or anything like that. You know, Michael was a performer for those who don't know. He played at, at HFS festival. I'm, I'm, I don't know if they have that. Do they have an HF? Unfortunately, they don't. They, they don't. stopped it years ago. So I might, I'm kind of dating myself. It's, it's, it's a cool festival. What would You've it be? time stamped yourself. Well, I've time stamped myself. So what is it? What is it called? Uh, I Heart Radio. Right, right, right. Yeah, okay. Same equivalent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah the equivalent. <laughs> so you played in that. Tell, tell us a bit about your band and all that and what, you know, what used to go on back then. Sure. I was in a band called Voodoo Blue and... Um, that's all I wanted to do, honestly, was was play music. That's what I had my mindset on, and it was great, and I got a lot of release uh, from that. And we we were I, I would say we were regionally successful. And I think we started when I was maybe fifteen or sixteen. I was in some other bands, and then met a group of guys, and they propositioned me, and and I joined. And then I got to live in a conversion van and tour around parts of the country and play a lot of shows and do a lot of really incredible things. With and no shoes on. With no I, shoes. Yeah. I did not wear shoes. Every picture, no shoes. Yeah. I, I, I did not own any more shoes, actually, <laughs> for that period of my life. And I had calluses, really, really large calluses on my feet, so much so that I could put there cigarettes were, out on them. They were large shoes. They yeah. were like... Well, then I got Birkenstocks. I upgraded the Birkenstocks <laughs> at one point in my life. Um, but no, that was honestly one of the best uh, times. It was something I really loved and I really enjoyed. And... That's what I had my mind set on when I was younger. I didn't have any aspirations of going to school or working or doing anything, really. It was just I wanted to, to play music. Did, would, would you say that period was fun? A lot, a lot of times in recovery we talk about there was a time where it was fun. Yeah. Sounds like that was... For the majority of it, it was a blast. It was great. You got to you know sing songs that ultimately... I like songs that you can hang yourself to, like really emotionally tugging yeah. By yourself in the car, crying because my girlfriend left me, kind of, you know, those types of things. I'm a product of the uh, of the 90s, so that's what we did. Yeah. But then when you get to write something so emotional in your room, in your own home, and then you watch someone else actually sing it and feel it and understand it, it really is a, a feeling that there's there's no high like it, to be honest with you. It's yeah. pretty incredible. Um, and I'm grateful for the experience. And it was a lot of fun. We uh, met a lot of really cool people and, you know, met other bands and met a lot of uh, fans 
you know, which had its uh, its fun benefits from time to time. Yeah, I bet. And uh, <laughs> it was great. And then just like most things, as addiction does, it ruins everything. And yeah. It, it, it took that away and, you know. You, you, you led me into my next thought as, you know, it's it's fun until it isn't. Right. So that ends. How did that end? So, I mean, it, it, it's funny because I think about it and it really was my entire existence at that point. I identified myself as somebody that played music. That was who I was. That and was, you're how old at this time? I am, when it ended, I was 20. Okay. And I had been to treatment already once. I uh, was living while back at home. In, while you're in Voodoo Blue, yep. you, you, you go to treatment once. Go to treatment okay. once. And uh, had been arrested as an adult once at that point. We had some some run-ins, you know, under uh, under the age of 18. But at the time, I guess they didn't really count, yeah. at least in my own mind. And it just, it escalated. And it escalated to a place where my manager at the time, his name was Jeff, unfortunately passed away a couple years ago, but um, great guy, really caring guy, ended up reaching out to my father, and I had uh, been arrested again. I missed a really big show that we were supposed to do uh, downtown. Obviously, the band was very upset. And they were, uh, you know, drinking was, was very social, and uh, marijuana use was social. I was into a lot of other things that they were not into that were not social. And when I got arrested again, they basically had a little powwow. Um, the manager called my father. It, it turned out that one of the attorneys contacted him. My name was on a list of people that were suspected of dealing and doing these things. And although that wasn't necessarily my niche, I was doing some of that. And um, it had just exploded, basically, out of, out of nowhere. And, yeah, they had a meeting and told me that I was out. And that's that. And they're going to move on without me. And I remember vividly, because I used to talk about this early in recovery, getting home, crying uh, uncontrollably on the little steps of my folks' house outside the house they still live in now, and then getting high and feeling nothing. And it took that away from me. Something so intense of a feeling of just grief and, and not understanding how to really deal with emotion and, and all that stuff other than to not feel any of it. And the drugs were really good for that. And it served its purpose. And um, I ended up you know, going to another facility at that point and then uh, was subsequently shipped to Florida. There's a lot of power in, in, in what you just shared that there's often a sort of reoccurring theme with, with people that use the, the dulling effect of the drugs. I don't, I don't want to feel anymore or, or the avoidance of some sort of <clears throat> trauma, tragedy, you know, any number of things that, that can lead to, you know, sort of why we use. And, and yeah, yeah if, if, if drugs and alcohol, you know, were the answer, what was the question? And that's often what we, we dive into around here. So, um, I, I really like the way you describe that because it's a, that's a that's a huge loss. Yeah, and this thing that that really you just as you just stated you want to do for the rest of your life is is just you know t- torn away from you, and then straight to using it and and nothing. Yep, and um, a lot of blame. You know, at that point in my life, I was not capable of taking any personal responsibility for my own actions or that tends any to be, of that stuff. Tends to be the case for, yeah. for almost all of us. Is like this is just pointing left and right here and there. Correct. The, uh, yeah, I the know. old blame thrower. The old bl- I was very good. I was a good. I had a big old blame thrower. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it's it's interesting to look back. It's like watching a movie of someone else's life is how it often feels. Because I mean, it was we did a lot of really cool stuff, like I mentioned. And then when it was stripped, I remember just blaming and being very resentful, as if I was the victim and I was harmed in this situation and I didn't do anything wrong. I mean, when the reality is, is it was all my actions. It was all my doing. And I could have avoided that completely. And my life would be very different today. Now, if I hadn't gotten um, clean, sober, I, I believe that I would have ended up, I don't even know. I mean, I'm sure we would have done well. We ended up getting a contract about six months before I got um, kicked out. We were supposed to go on this really excellent tour. And um, I don't know where I'd be, but I assume it would probably be overdosed at some point or, or back in jail. Inevitably. I yeah. can't imagine there was some shining scenario there. Yeah. The sickest part, though, if I'm being completely honest, is I remember thinking that back then and not really caring so much my goal in life was to play music and to be famous by any means necessary if i could have found where the crossroads was where they sold their soul i would have went there immediately i just didn't know where the location was (laughs) um yeah that was that was the mindset so when it was stripped i mean truly it was that was you know we worked very hard we treated it like a job we practiced every day and um yeah, I didn't know who I was at that point. It was just like a weird vacant shell that had a dope habit. Well, a lot, a lot of the making. It sounds like you, you always had a lot of the makings of, of being an entrepreneur, even in, even in that 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 discipline and whatever it looked like, going and practicing every day, being involved with it with a bunch of guys, um, in formulating a a as well as a group, a, a business entity, right? I mean, you, yeah. you don't just 
you be some sort. You're not some sort of group of slouches when you get when you get brought onto to a, a tour or something. Even sure. at, even the HFS festival. Yeah. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I know, I know a lot of gory details. I, I happen to know you personally, and and um, I know how it looked when you were sitting in the hospital at the end, and, and um, how somebody came in and, and, and introduced a program of recovery to you and things like that. Um, wh- wh- how many times? So you, you went to treatment twice? Three. I Three. went twice here in Maryland, and then afterward I was sent to a sober living environment in Florida. I had no more options here. I burned the bridges, and, um, you know, back in... 2005 at the time it was early 2005 that was pretty common was to then send someone out and, and that's where i ended up it was either florida or there was some other state that was very cold so it was a pretty easy decision to make. yeah and i i stayed abstinent there for a couple months but i didn't do anything for my recovery i didn't understand i believed that the program had lied to me i was introduced to narcotics anonymous through h&i mm-hmm. when they came into the center and all i heard was that if i stopped using, I stopped shooting heroin, I would be happy. And that is not the promise, my friend. I have learned over time. But with the recovery piece, if I do the basic suggestions, if I get a sponsor, I work a program, you know, I work steps, I find a God in my understanding, then then I can find happiness. Um, But the only thing that's guaranteed or promised is that if we do those things, we never have to use again. I did not understand that. And I stopped using I didn't do any work, and I was absolutely miserable. And I went back out in Florida, like we had mentioned, and then after the hospital stay, because I, I want to spare the viewers of, of going over any real detailed goriness, but an abscess and some uh, overdoses yeah, later, he, MRSA. He almost, uh, let's just encapsulate it real quick, he almost got his arm cut off, is, yep. is the way to put it. So Correct. He, Surgically. I, I'm looking yeah. at him right now, he has both his arms. Just Thank God for that. Case yeah. I like my left arm, and I will keep it, and I'm very grateful for it. And yeah, after that happened, I went to my last, uh, what will hopefully be my last treatment facility that I had to go to as a client. So, you know, fast forward some 15 plus years, you, you get into recovery, you spend, you spend a dozen, a dozen years of that down in Florida, getting introduced to treatment. Yeah. Right. You, you, You start your own treatment center, your first one, when? Probably almost seven years ago now. Okay. Six and a half, seven years. Six and a half, seven years ago. It's, it's a common thing down there. Yes, at the time especially. Right. So what what made you think that, that you could do it? So it was interesting because when I got um, clean and sober, uh, I didn't really have any professional skills. I hadn't gone to college. I had done a couple classes at the local Catonsville Community College here in good old Baltimore County. And... Um, I worked in a restaurant, which you know was great. I actually think everyone should work in a restaurant at some point in their life. It was very healthy. A lot of skills that are learned uh, working in the service industry. But I got very lucky, and somebody saw something in me that I certainly could not see myself, yoked me up out of my home group, and gave me a mentorship, really, helped me get my record expunged. And I started learning more about the professional world, and we got into health insurance, and that subsequently led into a prescription advocacy um, program that we created, and then you know, we started looking at other ventures. I had a lot of friends that I got clean with that ended up in the substance abuse and mental health industry. They were in a variety of different ancillaries. So one did the RCM, which is, it stands for revenue cycle management, the billing side of things. Um, a couple of them were in, um, admissions and a couple of them had started their own centers and I was seeing what they were doing. And honestly, the fulfillment that they got out of it by being able to give back in that way was really attractive. Um, It's also a business, but it's also something that we can get behind, that I can get behind and feel really good about. At the end of the day, I was given an opportunity that most people don't get when I went to this last treatment center. And it's important to be able to offer and open the doors and make sure those barriers are small to get somebody help when that window of lucidity and willingness is so tiny to get them in and and to get someone help quickly. So it seemed attractive on a lot of different levels. But in all fairness, I didn't know what I was doing. So I... You know, thankfully, I'm pretty well resourced and know a lot of different people. And after asking around, we recruited a really good team that did know what they were doing and program specialists and program integrity and the clinical side and, you know, all the other stuff that comes along with it. Yeah, certainly from from seven years ago, I, I have been, you know, alongside you for uh, going on, you know, four or five years now. And so yeah, I, I would agree with so many aspects, aspects of what you just shared, the the fact that we both get to help people you know, run businesses, uh, employ people, mm-hmm. right? That, that, that's one of the huge benefits to this is, is 
I recently had someone um, contact me <laughs> that, that said, you told me that I, I would be able to apply for a uh, No, you told me that I would be able to have a job after getting a year clean, sober. And they contacted me on, on whatever it was, Facebook Messenger or something. And I said, no, <laughs> I said that you could apply for a job after it said I wasn't just going to give you one. We were not going to enable this stuff. Right. You know how we are. I know how I was. Um, and, and I'm not just handing you a job after right. a year. You can apply for one. So I'm happy to say that that should be underway. And I encourage them to get their resume in order. So what, one of the great many benefits of, of doing what we do is that, that we can help in, in a variety of ways. It, it, it's important for folks out there to hear how, how has owning operating these centers you know impacted your own company and, and uh, there's a part b to that in the sense that i have often heard from people that have worked in treatment there's there's some old timers that 20 30 years clean sober that you know don't allow treatment to replace your own recovery 100 percent. yeah i think that's necessary but before we miss the point i wanted to kind of just circle back to the idea of giving people opportunities um, when for all intents and purposes i should never have a, had an opportunity to be where i am if I had continued to use, obviously I wouldn't be here. And it was that person that saw something in me that was able to give me a shot that worked out. It's one of the biggest benefits we have, and it gives me the same fulfillment, just to kind of tie it back in. We were talking about mus music and different fulfillment that self gets from those types of things. And it's interesting because one of the intangible items that, we, that, that I, I'll keep it on myself, ended up receiving from this whole process is that, that I did not anticipate. It wasn't even something I had conceptualized when we started doing any type of business. But being able to reach out to someone that, for all intents and purposes, wouldn't usually work in any professional environment and grooming and watching them grow and expand their, their knowledge base and become these just incredible people, you know, you, we don't get that stuff anywhere else. It's, yeah. it's pretty phenomenal. Um, but to answer the question directly, I think that that is a really important topic, actually. I'm, it's, it's awesome that you're bringing it up. I watched many people, and I'm grateful for those observations that got into the field whether that was as an owner capacity or they were working uh, direct client care, behavioral health technicians. I know plenty of clinicians that got into the field and, um, and did replace their, their own recovery. They were people in recovery and they assumed that working in treatment was a uh, replacement, if yeah. you will. Like I don't have to go to a meeting today because I was just right. sitting in group or I don't need to call my sponsor today because I talked to you know a, a fellow therapist or a clinician. And I watched a lot of them go out. And the ones that didn't go out, I watched them completely lose a lot of the things that we pick up in our 12-step program as far as the principles and growing and continue to look at self and self-introspection and all the different things. And I had a pretty healthy fear of that the entire time. So, I mean, in layman's terms, what we do for our profession is not my own recovery at all. And it also took me a long time to realize and understand that my recovery is different from other people's recovery. Just because Narcotics Anonymous has worked for me and it's worked great and I haven't found the need to go anywhere else, that isn't the case for everybody. There's something for everyone. It's very individualistic. And as a, a treatment center provider, it's important for us to give opportunities for people to get better. That's the idea, to be successful and to be better. And those success measurements can be based in a lot of different ways. And just because my success looks one way does not mean someone else's success can't look differently and be equally as successful. Right. Um, and it did. It took me a long time to really fully understand that and grasp that. But I still, I still have a home group. I still go weekly. I go very regularly. I have a sponsor. I still sponsor eight men. Uh, these are things that I continue to do to hold myself accountable because the interesting thing about, you know, the 12 step program in Narcotics Anonymous is that it doesn't stop. The idea is for continued growth. Although the obsession to use has left a long, long time ago, and I'm very grateful for that. It becomes less and less about the substance itself and more and more about the personal growth in different areas. It's funny because, and I'm sure she wouldn't mind me sharing this, you know, my mom, my mother is a social worker, has been since she can, you know, wanted to do something. She's one of the only people I ever met that, you know, at the age of probably nine said, <laughs> this is what I want to do and I'm going to do it. And she just retired last year. Um, you know, she's well into her 60s now. So... The interesting part, though, is that even in some of the trainings that were happening in, in school and the things that, that you know a lot of the clinicians go through to get their very variety of degrees, the idea of addiction is not looked at so thoroughly. It's a lot of other items that are brought up. And it was as I went through my own process, even somebody being in, in the field of social work, it was difficult for that transition to happen. Point is, just to skip to the end, 
she was actually implementing 12 step literature with clients of hers that were not necessarily in recovery. It's something that could be universal. The principles behind the steps help us to grow and to be better people and ultimately to, to be humble enough to accept feedback and to be courageous enough to look inward at herself to figure out where we need to work and, and what issues we actually have. It's pretty phenomenal. It is phenomenal. That, that, that's an important message for the listener to know as well is, is this sort of unknown entity oftentimes in the movies you know aa is portrayed you know people sitting in the circle and stuff and the depth the depth of what happens in, in those um meetings and this stuff I, it can't possibly be covered in the, in the movies and, and, and you touched on a, on a lot of great points is that i i know for a fact that you know spending time in these facilities the these environments of care that i i can leave at the end of the day and, and i am sure as I'm not going to use the word, uh, but that I'm not going to use today. Right. And it can very well confuse that for the fact that, you know, because I'm so sure of that I'm not going to attend this group tonight at 7 p.m., which is, you know, part of my own recovery. And so it's, it's important to hear that. Um, and I know that about you, and it's great for that the listeners can, can, can hear that part of, part of it as well. Um, I think about all the treatment centers – Thousands, I would, I guess, really across the nation at this point. It's not just you know Florida and California anymore. There, there. We, we ourselves, we have centers in what is it now? Six now, states. Now seven. Seven states. North Carolina uh, just got added to the list. North Carolina. So, so in case the listeners don't know, run run over those. North Carolina, Georgia, Ohio, Texas, Florida, Maryland, and Ohio. Ohio, right. So it, I don't think we have enough time to go over all those programs, but ne- nevertheless, as, as I often open up with and and share at the end, um, you can always call our our uh, contact center at eight five five eighty sober, and they will be able to direct you for, to the best level of care. And it might not always happen to be in in, in the state where you find yourself, um, and, and we can always navigate that and help you with that. Um, but what 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 would you say makes us different? Makes amateurs recovery centers. It's a great question, and honestly, we get asked this all the time. If we, it's funny, Kabir and I, you know, Kabir's one of my closest friends. We've done a lot of interviews together also. We were yes. both set up, uh, you know, with, with larger cameras than this uh, on our beautiful faces asking a lot of questions. <laughs> and this one, without fail, always comes up. Always that's comes always up. the question that's asked, and I always give the same exact answer. We do not pretend to be um, the creators of something brand new. At the end of the day, there's a lot of things that are proven to work. There's now scientific studies that are coming out about AA, about NA, about 12 step fellowships and the benefits they have about treatment, about organized, uh, clinicians and how to go through individual therapy, etc. We have not recreated the wheel. The thing that makes us different and that separates us completely is our culture and our staff. It's the people. And I know for me, when I went to this treatment facility, some 15 and a half years ago, it was the staff that I related to. I related to my behavioral health technician, who was a BHT named Matt, more than I did my therapist, more than I did the clinical directors at that place. And it was that relatability and the non-judgment that came from him that allowed me to kind of let my walls down enough to even hear the message and to even think for a second that I was worthwhile, you know, to try and to get hope. And we talk about hope a lot because that's the only principle of the steps that I can give to somebody else and receive myself. And I believe that's what separates us. When you walk into an Amadeus Recovery Center facility, the feeling and the staff is the heartbeat of what we do. Great services, great clinical program. I don't want to dismiss any of that. It's phenomenal. And I think that we do wonderful work and our percentages and our outcome measurements prove that. But it's really the clientele and the staff um, that I think makes us different. It's people that want to come back, not because there's a relapse necessarily, but the alumni programs and getting families involved and all the other dynamics of what we do is because of the people. Yeah. Like I mentioned before, and come back and, and, and seek employment. Yep. That's a, that's a major, major indicator of, of who we are. I agree. I agree. And the best compliment we could probably get. Best compliment. You know. So, leads me to my next question. And, and it's a large one in the sense number one thing that needs to change about substance abuse treatment field these days. Hmm. That's interesting. There's a lot. Yeah. Um, you think there's a, you think there's one that, that stands out the most? Um, I'm going to try to, to pinpoint the one that I think would be most relevant um, that people would understand outside of the industry. Also. I had to ask you something 
too hard here because some, yeah. some of these questions i'm like i know his answer right to, to you know what makes us different because we talk about it this is a good one honestly yeah. so i would say honestly that i think the regulations always need to get tightened up mm-hmm. and if i looked on a broad scale i think that's where i would hit the nail on the head so maryland is where we sit right now mm-hmm. and as an example maryland's one of the first states that actually made it necessary to have a national accreditation before you can even submit for licensure to open up a treatment center at any level of care, whether it is a basic outpatient or or a higher level. And at first, I was curious to see why they did that. And as we've been in the field now for, you know, a number of years, we see more and more people who probably have good intentions and are probably looking to do good work that have no business owning and operating any type of medical clinic. Forget treatment for a second, but this would be no different from someone opening a, you know, an urgent care or a hospital or something like right. that. But especially when you're dealing with what is, you know, potentially the most vulnerable population at the most vulnerable points of their lives, including their families that are trying to, you know, in a desperate measure, try to get their loved ones help or themselves help. It's important that um, that those standards are kept across the board. And I think that, you know, obviously we do a great job of that. And there's a lot of other providers that do also. But I think a lot gets lost through uh, uh, the cracks. Yeah. No, thank you. Thank you for your perspective on that. I, I, I certainly agree with that in a lot of ways. And you see places popping up and, and things of the sort. And, and uh, um, yeah, hopefully other states continue to adopt a, a number of things that we do here in, in Maryland. I, yep. It's a great, great example. Well, there you have it, folks. If you didn't believe in sober success stories before, I'm certain you do now. I want to thank Michael Silverman for joining us today. Thanks, Mike. Thank you, Kabir. Of course sharing his amazing story with us. <clears throat> if you or a loved one needs help with addiction, call Amethyst today at 855-80-SOBER or visit us online at amethystrecoverycenters.com. To hear more episodes of SHARE, visit amethystrecoverycenters.com backslash SHARE or download SHARE wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for tuning in to another episode. I'm Kabir Singh, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>